Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I am your host, JP John Paz. With me today is a special guest, a returning guest, of course, the legendary man that was the president of WCW. Of course, he is a WWE Hall of Famer, the man behind the 83 Weeks of Dominance, which is actually more than that, if you really look into it. The man behind the NWO, Easy e Eric Bischoff. Eric, how are you doing today, sir? John, good to be back with you. I'm doing very well. Thank you. So what's going on in your world? You seem to be keeping very, very busy these days. Isn't that crazy? Um, yeah. I mean, um, you know, between the podcast and doing shows like yours and the other things that I do for the ad-free shows platform, which is considerable, <clears throat> a lot of great content going on there. Uh, and I like to participate in that. Got a couple really interesting projects uh, that have been in development, one for almost two and a half years that is uh, starting to take on a, a very exciting life. And another uh, couple that are, you know, developing, but developing in the right way. So just a lot of fun stuff going on. And I, you know, occasionally get to do some stuff for WWE, like the a &E special that we saw last week. And, you know, between all of that and trying to spend as much time with our new grandson as we can, my wife and I are, uh, I think we're busier now than we've been in the last 10 years. Awesome to see you on TV for the A&E biography. You were kind of like the, the focus of it, which was cool. What was that whole experience like? Because, you know, as the fan, like we know stuff, but it's always cool to kind of go back and relive it too. Well, I, I truth is I was somewhat reluctant. I, I want to emphasize somewhat because it's, you know, anytime you get an opportunity to do something, you know, on a network like A&E or any network, really, you know, it's nice to stay out in front of the public. It's nice to stay at least peripherally relevant and things like that. Um, but, you know, my deep down inside, I was like, oh, man, are we going to talk about that again? I mean, <laughs> how much how much more of this can people possibly be interested in? And I enjoyed doing it. The producers that came out to my home uh, to produce it were really, really good and just great guys. We ended up making dinner for them and hanging out and things like that. Um, they were really good guys. But when I saw the finished product, you know, last Sunday night, I was, I was really impressed. I was really impressed. They did such a great job of, yes, we've heard the story before you, people have heard it from me. They've heard it from Nash. They've heard it from Hogan. They've heard it from Scott Hall when he was with us. They've heard it from Xbox. They've heard it from a lot of people that really shouldn't have been talking about it quite honestly. But um, it, it, they did such a phenomenal job of bringing new life to it and taking the NWO story beyond just what happened in the ring and talking about the, the impact of the NWO storyline on pop culture and on mainstream television, you know, bringing up shows like Breaking Bad and, and others that tied into the kind of, you know, anti-hero theme that we really created with Nitro. That was all fascinating to me, and they just did a great job. And to me, too, I felt like they really hit home with that pop culture stuff because so many fans that maybe weren't didn't live in that era like me and, like, live through it, you guys really changed the business because the WWF was okay then. WWF was, you know, kind of coming along. That NWO thing happens. <sighs> like a rocket ship the business change and people i know they love to say game changer and that stupid line that i hate that they say which makes no sense because it's not true oh tony storm's a game changer you know whoever they say yeah. you know, which like the end of the other the one is or the other one that I, I i start to you know throw up in my mouth the minute i see it before i even read the story but when i see a headline that has generational talent <laughs> attached to it it was like oh god here we go. The NWO actually changed the business. It was actually a game. I mean, that act, I mean, literally led into the Monday Night Wars, which led into the attitude. Era. I mean, it changed the business forever. It did. In fact, if you're going to apply generational to anything, I think in terms of a generational storyline, um, it would have to be NWO. And I say that, uh, and it's evidenced by any, any convention I ever go to, I've got, you know, I've got a 45-year-old or 50-year-old dad, you know, wearing his NWO shirt. I got, uh, you know, a 16- or 18-year-old kid wearing his NWO shirt. And, oh, yeah, they bring their little nephew who's six, and he's wearing an NWO shirt. And surprisingly, some of these kids know what the NWO is all about. And, you know, many thanks to the Peacock Network, WWE streaming platform for that. But it is a storyline 
and, and it was a moment more than anything else. And I think that's one of the things that was brought up in that special. Uh, it's more that it was more than a story. Like it was a moment in time that generations of wrestling fans are still talking about today. It's one of those things as a fan, as a kid, you know, living through and go through high school with it. If we all pretend we're the NWO, we do like not really beat people up, but like gang stuff. We're like, we're together. You know, it, it was one of the things where, like you actually like changed even us as, as fans. We were acting like you guys. We were pretending where you were, you guys like we're, we're trying to live vicariously through you. We were so into the show. We would like lived and died through the NWO almost. It was crazy. Yeah. And I think the word aspirational is probably best describes you know, that experience that you're referring to, because you, you're not only interested in something, you kind of identify with them and you aspire to live that way or be like that character or exist in an environment like the NWO existed in. You know, all those things are aspirational in a sense as, as in terms of a fictional storyline. And that's one of the elements that the NWO had that made it so powerful. The thing that came out of, of this show that everyone kept talking about was Starcade 97. I know everyone's talked about it to death. I do a show with Kevin Sullivan. Of course, you were on it about a year ago or so. You were on it with us. We, we talked a little bit about it. But I feel like that's one of the things where I always thought about how come we didn't just pretend because Sting kind of gets his shoulder. How come we didn't pretend Sting kicked out? And Kevin had no answer for it either. I know that's like, a like oh, they could have done that instead of the fast count. I always thought about that. And no one ever talks about it. Like, just pretend Sting kicked out and maybe go that direction. Was that ever brought up as far as starting? No, Wars? no. And that's a really good point. And, you know, that would have worked really effectively. Um, but the reality in the, in the situation, in the moment, when it was actually happening, everything that happened in the last 60 seconds before that finish was completely surprising to everyone. You know, obviously, according to Sting in the ring, um, the referee was confused. Obviously, Nick Patrick, uh, he was being pulled in different directions. I certainly had what I thought was the finish going into that. And it caught everybody by surprise. And we had to deal with it in the moment, right? We had to make a decision literally overnight. And I don't think we made the best decision. Right? We, we made the decision that we made, obviously, and we ended up kind of regrouping for February, I think it was. But, uh, man, uh, in that moment, there would have probably been three or four better ways to get out of that. And we probably left two or three of them on the table. I said this to uh, Sullivan, and I know Conrad has brought this up too. I for like in my head, and now me and Conrad are probably right about the same age too, so probably maybe the same thought process fan-wise – thinking about it like shouldn't nick patrick have been fired for that like the, i always think that like why wasn't he fired he he screwed up you know but i don't well, know he, maybe no, but he didn't him. as far as the fan in the audience and watching on television patrick didn't screw up that three count was a three count now we internally may have felt that way or somebody may have felt that way but um as far as what was presented on TV, which is what I was really the most concerned with, it, it wasn't an obvious. In fact, if it would have been obvious that Patrick screwed up, it would have made the storyline and the finish a whole lot easier. Interesting. Now, I, I feel like everyone always kind of skirts around it. Was Sting, like, in the best shape he could have been at that point? I know the joke was he's not tan and stuff, but, like, was he in, like, the right frame of mind? Was he in the best shape at that point? Like, what did you think about Sting at that point? You know, and this is probably one of the reasons why I continue to take as much heat as I'm, I take for this is th there were certain there were certain things going on in that moment that are personal, and it's not up to me to talk about them. And until somebody else does, I'm just going to kind of ride the ride the edges of that explanation as best I can. It, it, look, ultimately, it was Hulk Hogan's decision. Hulk Hogan had creative control. And it's interesting that I read a couple headlines shortly after that A&E special came out. Eric Bischoff finally admits Hulk Hogan exercised creative control. That's not true. It may be the first time that the light bulb went off in that writer's head, but I've explained it pretty thoroughly for a number of years where we went into that finished meeting um, planning on one thing that we've been planning on for a year and a half. And then when, during the course of that meeting, certain people felt uncomfortable. 
And I refer to, you know, Sting's tan. I think in general, uh, I think it's safe to say mindset. You know, where was everybody's heads at going into that meeting? And that's part of it, folks. You know, scripting, planning, executing, wrestling is just that. It's scripted. It's, it's not real. And in order to execute a really great storyline and a really good finish, great finish, Everybody's head has to be in the in the game and on the same page, and if that's not the case, you ad, you adjust. And Hulk wasn't feeling it. Simple as that. He just didn't feel it. He he wasn't feeling it. I'm not going to go into detail why. But once Hulk made that decision, now I'm faced with the choice of either getting in a head to head with Hulk Hogan, who ultimately had creative control. That was one way I could have reacted. The other way I could have reacted was to try to negotiate. And when I say negotiate, I mean compromise, get everybody else to compromise. Okay, we don't feel exactly that, but how about if we do it this way, right? Um, I attempted that. And could have worked and probably would have worked if we would have had a day or two to discuss and think through and just be honest with everybody involved might probably have been a, not might, it probably would have been a, a better outcome. Uh, or I could just go with it. I attempted, you know, to, to start a conversation and, and try to ne negotiate, you know, the finish that we really wanted, but there wasn't time. There just wasn't time. And I know people listening will go, what do you mean there wasn't time? It was three hours before, whatever it was. But yeah, you're talking about to get to that point, you're talking about a two and a half, three hours of conversation. And when you finally do make a decision, and we were already up against this wall, you've got to communicate that decision to a lot of people. And while the show is going on, I've got to have a, a production meeting with my director while he's calling a live shoot. You know what I mean? Yep. There, there were a lot of things that a lot of things have to happen when you make a, 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 a big decision um, about a finish. If you want to cover it correctly, your announcers have to have an idea of what's going on and at least have an idea of, you know, the direction to play it. Your director, as I mentioned, your cameramen have to be made aware. You know, there's a lot of things that have to happen. It's not just, oh, I'm going to tell Sting, Sting's going to tell Hogan, and then we're going to go out and do it. I wish it was that easy. It just sucks because 700,000 buys, that was a year-long build. One of the greatest builds I've ever seen in a pay-per-view, going all the way back from when Sting turns into the Crow, refuses to join the NWO. They, they use that awesome doors line on him, come up, break on through to the other side. He refused to do it. Uncensored, he comes down for the ceiling, gets one of the biggest pops I've ever heard, and, and we're kind of off to the races. And then that happens. It was like, ah. Oh. Just like, uh, as Sully always says, a shot in the, the Titanic. It was like, oh, yep. man. That was built up. I mean, one of the best built up I've ever seen. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I felt that way. I felt strongly. In fact, I, I wouldn't even really engage in too much of a conversation if somebody wanted to argue that point. Right. Because it was. It was everything you could hope a storyline to be. It progressed every week. It built anticipation. New characters emerged out of that story. Um, and some became very powerful characters as a result of it. Um it had everything but a good ending. It, it was kind of like the, uh, what was that series? Dexter, right? Everybody yeah. was hooked on, hooked on Dexter. It was just one. It was like, it, it wasn't quite Breaking Bad because Breaking Bad was one of the first series of its kind. But but Dexter was kind of another one, right? An antihero. Yep. Just exactly what what um, they were talking about in the NWO series. It was an, it, it, Dexter was an anti-hero and the series, you know, from season to season to season kept getting better and better and better. And then finally, when they announced this is the final episode of the final season, everybody tuned in and the finish sucked. 
And now any, all any, anybody remembers is Dexter. Oh, yeah, finish sucked or ending sucked. Same thing. Yeah, that's one of those things. It's like you can't screw up the finish because everybody remembers the finish. And the finish guy got, got screwed after a year long. Let, let me finish that thought, though. Yep. And what I said, I, I would usually not even spend much time debating the subject mm -hmm. with people. I think I would take the opposite position today. I think the bloodline storyline, the bloodline storyline is definitely way better, technically, much better storytelling than wow, the NWO really? was. Wow. Yeah. I mean, technically. Um, it, the bloodline won't have as big of an impact on the wrestling industry as the NWO did, but that's more about the timing and the shift in formula going from teen and preteen WWE, yay, woo, garbage man, dentist, crazy IRS guys, all that stuff. And we did some of that too, you know, as Kevin will tell you, we did have Dungeon of Doom. Yes. All right. Yep. So we did have our we did have some of our teen preteen esque uh, characters in there, and and by the way, you need them too because not everybody is into one style of a wrestling character or one type of character, and and you do have other demos to serve, but the NWO changed all that, and because it changed all that for the very first time, I think people regard the NWO differently than they'll regard Bloodline. But if you talk to a script writer, if you talk to uh, Tom DeShane, who's done our, 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 our podcast over at Eight Free Shows a bunch of times and is my business partner in a couple of projects, uh, Tom DeShane is a Harvard graduate, a Shakespeare you know, scholar. He wrote a book about Shakespeare that won all kinds of Harvard awards. Um, he's studied storytelling going all the way back to Aristotle. And, and, and obviously Shakespeare, he knows what storytelling really is. And I've learned a lot from him in addition to other things I've read and been exposed to. So if you look at the bloodline storyline from a, from a scholar, scholarly perspective, I know that sounds weird, but it's, that's what Tom does. Uh, if you look at the, 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 the structure and all the things that go with it, the, the, the discipline, the, the three act structure of it in the sense that it's progressing. And, and there are certain emotional beats that you hit along the way that you have to hit in act one. And you really have to hit in act two. All of that is almost flawless. Whether WWE knows it or not, they mean, they know they've got a great storyline. I'm hoping they know why, so they can repeat the process. Right. But the bloodline storyline is technically a much better storyline. I think the NWO storyline will be better remembered just because of the time and the ma major shift in the way stories were told. That's why it will endure. But from a technical perspective, bloodline storylines much better than the NWO. And I think slightly better than the Sting storyline. Sting storyline did the same thing. You know, Sting storyline built slowly. There was a very, very well done act one and a well done act two and a well done act three all the way up until the final five minutes. Um, from a technical perspective, I think Sting's storyline was better than the NWO, but the bloodline storyline is even better than the Sting storyline because of the wow. discipline, the, the discipline. Um, so far, it's not over yet. Maybe they're going to have their last five minutes. They're going to, maybe they're going to Dexter themselves in the end. I don't know. But as of right now, I, I wouldn't bet on that. Surprising. You would, it's easy for you to just put NWO over and say, no, NWO is better, but you're putting, a, you know, that's your baby. So pretty big of you. You're putting over the bloodline over the NWO. I'm it's surprised. not putting them over. It's just being honest and recognizing what makes a good storyline and what doesn't, which is what 99 and 9 tenths percent of the fans, you know, who live on social media, and live on Reddit and live in Dave Meltzer's dirt sheet universe. They have no idea what hell a lot of people in AEW, including Tony Khan, doesn't know what makes a good storyline. You know, what, what they consider a good storyline is like, I don't, it's not a storyline. It's an angle with a couple promos and a finish. It's not a, it's not and a, a great match. Story. You know, they, the athleticism, you know, that's another thing too. I've noticed about AEW. I've been watching it more consistently lately. I know everybody puts it off. Oh, the wrestling's so much better. I got news for you out of a two hour show. Let's just say there's a uh, hundred minutes of actual in-ring 
that's being kind, probably closer to 90. Um, let's say there's 90 minutes of in-ring action. About 70 minutes is, yeah, that's okay. Well, about 20, 10 minutes of it, 15 minutes of it is kind of embarrassing. Like these people should not even be on television. Who did this? These are people that would be six months or three months into a power plant um, cycle in WCW. They're not ready for prime time at all, but they're out there. Um, and then you've got a good percentage of wrestling that's just pretty good. And then you've got a smaller percentage that's like, wow, these guys are really phenomenal athletes. They may not have a good story. They may not have any psychology. They may not have a lot of other things that are required to be really good wrestling. But the athleticism itself, the match, if all you care about is a match and you're not really invested in what the characters are doing or how good the characters are, and you don't even know because you just don't know what makes a good storyline, um, yeah, about 20%. Maybe 30% of AEW is really good wrestling. But for the most part, it's. I, I remember episodes of WCW Saturday Night back in the early 90s that had a lot better wrestling than I see on AEW. I totally agree. And I was actually talking to somebody from AEW, and they were saying they wish the matches were shorter so that more of the guys could get on TV because there'll be times when you don't see a guy for three weeks on TV and he just pops back in. So I was like, that's true, too. Sometimes the matches are too long. I, I don't know that I agree with that. I mean, it's one way of looking at it. And on paper, that kind of makes sense. But just giving, you know, more people more TV time is not creating better characters and better stories. People will remember great stories and great characters, whether those are in 15-minute matches or six-minute matches. If the characters are strong, they're compelling, the story behind it is interesting, the length of time doesn't matter. And the flip side of that is just putting people on TV isn't getting them over. That's a joke. That's that, that's an indie-rific way of looking at things. Oh, if I just had some more TV time. Yeah, but if you don't take advantage of that television time and you're not connecting with the audience in that television time because, you know, your creative is really weak, which is true in AEW 90% of the time. Um, if your creative is weak, your character isn't really well defined and you have no relationship with the audience, I don't care how many times they put you out on TV, you're not going to get over. And neither is a product. If you weren't like involved with the business, would you watch AEW? Like you said, you've been watching it. Would you continue to watch it, let's just say as a fan, or no, it's not for No, you. no, no. And that's not, you know, that's not a, a criticism of the AEW product, although I just got done criticizing it. But when I'm what, and that's one of the reasons why I, I look so objectively hard at AEW because I'm looking for things that illustrate to me or indicate to me that somebody's recognizing what they need to fix. Example if I see, and this is what I'm not seeing in AEW, but if I see a, a unique way of doing backstage interviews, not like we did them in 1992 which is what I see today in AEW. It's the same old, I'm here, you know, I'm Tony Schiavone and I'm standing here and to my right is, uh, and then it's a promo and then it's a run in or it's a, you know, a reaction from, from, from whoever the host, or whoever's holding the mic. Um, God almighty. We've been watching that narrative, that form of, cause that's all it is. It's a way to advance storyline using dialogue. It's not a physical dialogue. Like we see to match that, that hopefully tells a story. Um, more often than not, it doesn't, but hopefully it does. And then you've got the play-by-play -play and color commentary, which is another narrative, okay, that, that's dialogue. And then you've got the talent when they get the opportunity to do things in the ring or to do things backstage. That's another narrative. But when you've got talent that doesn't understand, first of all, they don't really have a story, so that makes it hard. Secondly, they're going out there and doing the same thing, the same way it's been done since whenever, the 80s. It's just not interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's a beer buzzer, meaning you see those things coming up. It's like, this is, okay, I'm going to go get a beer. I'll be back in three minutes, right? I don't need to watch this. Because you're not getting anything new or different or interesting or compelling. The 99 times out of 100, you're not. Once in a while, you do. Um, and that's across the board, too. That's WWE does the same thing. Just somebody's going to figure that out one day. But um, 
I so when I watch either AEW or WWE, I'm not watching it because I want to see who's going to win what match, or because I identify with a character, or most of the time, not because the the story is interesting to me, but in the case of WWE, the bloodline storyline is so interesting to me, but not like it is probably most fans. I'm looking at the story structure. I'm looking at the pacing of the arc and what happens when inside of each one of those individual arcs, because those are the elements that make a great story. So when I'm watching a great story, as I am with Bloodline, I'm not watching it for the same reason that almost every fan is. I'm looking for, I'm looking for the magic behind the curtain, how the story is being structured, executed, how it's being promoted, what questions are are they inciting, they meaning WWE, the audience to ask? You know, those are all the things that get me excited because that's the magic, right? It, think of it this way, John. Somebody goes to Vegas because they've heard about David Copperfield. They go, oh, I can't wait. I want to go see a great magic show. And they go. And the vast majority of the people that go to watch David Copperfield are just simply going to be entertained. But if there's other magicians in that audience, they're not looking for the magic. They're looking for how the magic is done. Hmm. And that's kind of how I watch wrestling. I don't watch it for the entertainment. I watch it to see how the magic is or, unfortunately, isn't being done. And that's why I've been watching AEW. I'm hoping that they're getting a clue. I'm hoping Tony Khan... um, is watching the bloodline storyline and not figuring out a way to replicate it. That's not it. But if you can, if you can break that story down into malleable components by malleable, I mean the inciting moment of a storyline, what kicks it off? What's the catalyst? What's that moment that creates that spark that sends these two people on whatever journey they're going to be on? assuming it's two people in the match. You know, I look for those beats. In those malleable moments, there's things that you can reproduce. Once you understand how to tie all those beats together and where they're supposed to be within an arc, you can then go back to that malleable moment and reshape it so that it's completely different, but it still serves the same purpose. I know it's getting kind of weird, but I hope that makes sense. When you're saying that, do you have to have like a Roman Reigns character, a guy that could bring it all home, like the guy with the it factor? Like the he's kind of to me the lead of the story. Whatever he's doing, even if he's not on camera, they're talking about him. He's the focus. Like, is that the most important part? Having him, that like that guy, like a Hogan guy, or can you still tell a good story without having a guy who's like you know the god of wrestling, so to speak? I'm thinking of the best way to answer that. It's the same reason why there are so many great independent films that are out there. A great story, good story, with a good director and good actors, even though they're, it's not Tom Cruise, it's not Lady Gaga, it's not whoever, right? I say Lady Gaga just because I just got done watching a clip of her and, um, oh, uh, God, I can't believe his, I, I forgot his name. The actor um, that played with her in the movie, A Star is Born. Um, oh, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper, yeah. Now, if you take Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga and, or, or any other female actor or actress and you plug them in a great story, of course it's going to become a blockbuster hit that people are going to, most people <laughs> are going to remember, right? But if you put unknown actors in that story, but it's well-directed, it's a great story, well-directed, decent acting, it's still a great story, and it will do well. It just won't get the, you know, the kind of acclaim. So the answer to your question is, no, I don't think every great story or every good story has to have a huge star. There's a lot of great stories out there. There's a lot of shows that I watch now on streaming where I only know one or two of the characters. Uh, one or two of the actors and many of the actors and actresses are people that I've not seen before that are just emerging, but they can emerge because it's a great story. 
he seems like for me Roman is like the the, the stirrer of the drink. Like he's the guy. Everyone's like, oh, Sammy should have won the title. Sammy wasn't over until Roman Reigns. And if everyone can go back and watch this, he literally says in an interview, I forget who the interviewer was. He goes, I'm gonna handpick Sammy. I'm gonna get this guy over because I like him and he's got something. So like without Roman. I don't know if Sammy kind of gets to that spot. I mean, Sammy did awesome in his role, but to me, do you see that too? It's like Roman's kind of the guy. He, I mean, the number one YouTube guy, the number he's a box office guy. To me, he's the, the, uh, uh, I want to say like the guy who pushes the fo- the this story forward to me. Anyway, it's all about him to me. Well, I, I see. I disagree with that. I, I, mm. I, and I think Roman is probably more over now than he's been in the last 995 days that they've been pushing him. Yeah, right? they've been pushing him for a long time. three years. Yeah, and, and yeah. even before this most recent push, there were several long term attempts to push him and get him over that just didn't work. Um, but he's the A story, and that's another thing. You know, you have to have a an anchor story, right? A story that is essentially driving the passion for your show. It's your central story. If you go watch any feature film, there's not five stories going on and each one of them are, are equal. That's not how that works. You have a main plot, Roman Reigns. You have a subplot. What's going on with Sammy? What's going on with Jay? Where do those two characters go? Ooh, it's all within the context of the same story. It's all within the context of the A story. But there are sub stories going on within the A story subplot and in the case of wrestling because it's a three hour show two or three hour show that airs 52 weeks a year you've got multiple stories you've got a b story you got a c story you got a d story and so on and then you've got some segments that that don't necessarily have to have stories because you're introducing talent or you're creating a backstory for a future story right so not everything has to be you know layered and detailed and 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 executed with the same level of discipline and planning as an A story, because it's not that important, but eventually, hopefully those D stories turn into C stories that turn into B stories that turn into an A story. Cause you, you spent time along that journey, defining those characters, giving yourself some backstory to work with because it's all fictional and it, you get there. But right now in this story, I agree. It's all about it's all about um, Roman Reigns. But my issue with the Sammy argument, oh, they should have put it on Sammy. That's a Dave Meltzer, you know, knee jerk fanboy dirt sheet approach. Well, you saw the crowd in Montreal, and the data says it was this douchebag talking about data is funny. Well, it was his hometown, though. So it, it was just what Dave. <laughs> that's why they were crazy. Yeah, but that's why. It's yeah. just what Dave wants, right? So right. he's trying to justify his feeling and trying to get other people to agree with them. I look at it like I said it on my podcast. If I was Sami Zayn and somebody would have come to me that Saturday morning and said, okay, we're going to have you go over Roman because, well, you know, this crowd loves you. And last couple of weeks you've really emerged as a, as, as a, as a important character in the story. So we're going to put it on you. If I would have been Sam, I, I said, no, pump the brakes, bitches. I don't want that. The power, the value, the the opportunity for Sami Zayn is the journey. The fact that he finally has the audience wanting him to win, that's act one. That's the that's the, he has now completed the first act of the Sami Zayn story. He's done it within the bloodline storyline, but he's now able to spin out of that and carry all that weight all that equity that he's created, right? Yep. That's the beginning of Sami Zayn's story. Had he won the championship or had he beat Roman in Elimination Chamber, that would have been the end of his story because it's all downhill after that. Then it's all about who's coming after you, Sammy, and it's the chase. Baby faces should be chasing that championship. Once a baby face gets it, unless he's an amazingly over baby face, you know, like they come along once every 20 or 30 years, a rock, a Steve Austin. Now nah, I wouldn't even throw Steve Austin in there. A, a, a rock, a Hogan. Um, Flair was always, you know, his best as a heel. But if you're a best thing, if you're a baby face, 
champion, you better pray to the wrestling gods that you've got half of a roster of really good heels waiting in line. Otherwise, you're going to get three or four months out of it, and then it's going to be next. Whereas yeah, need- if Sammy, if Sammy in the position he's in now, man, that's his opportunity. That's where he's going to make the most money. He's not going to make that much. He's, well, he's going to make a lot of money, but he's not going to make as much money with a short-term run as champion as he will with a long, long-term chase to become the champion. My whole thing was on the, on a B show, Elimination Chamber is technically a B pay per view. I don't think you're going to end a 900 plus day title run on anything but a big show like a WrestleMania too. I feel like it's got to happen on a grand scale. No, like if if Roman look, 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 there's two there's two ways of looking at it. I agree with you from a purely business perspective. Of course, absolutely, not 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 a question. You want to maximize your opportunity to make money. Yep, there you go. Major pay per view. However, I would argue that occasionally it's nice to break that pattern because with a pattern comes predictability. And sometimes breaking a pattern keeps people interested in what you're doing beyond just that one big event. It's it, absolutely from a revenue producing point of view, there's no question, but from a strategic creative a strategic slash creative approach if the situ- if the story was right and the timing was right i wouldn't have any opportunity doing it on a on a secondary pay-per-view because it keeps you unpredictable one of the things i did when we launched nitro before we launched nitro long before we ever shot a minute of tape um, we did a lot of research all over the United States, focus groups with a third party research group that focused solely on entertainment. And I went to many of, I didn't go to every one of them, but I went to many of them all over the country, went to some in the East coast, Chicago, uh, Nashville, um, Omaha, a couple in California. I think I did one in Oregon or Washington. And I got to sit behind a, a, a mirror and I could see out, but they couldn't see me, right? So they didn't know I was there. And in this focus group, you got 25, 30, 35, 40 people, and they've all been pre-screened. So some of them are hardcore WWF fans. Now, this is the research that I did. They were hardcore WWF fans. You had some that were hardcore WCW fans. You had some that were, yeah, I, 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 I kind of watch them both. I don't really care one way or the other. And then you had a group that was called lapsed fans, meaning they used to watch wrestling, but they really don't anymore and they just don't yep. care. But they used to watch it. So you'd show this group a large series of videos and clips from videos. And, you know, you track because you, they had little dial meters. And while they're watching something on a television and they were instructed, the more you like it, turn it to the right. The least you like it, turn it to the left. If you don't care at all, leave it in the middle, right? So all of these dial meters were kind of connected and you, we behind the mirror could sit, literally sit back, watch what they were watching and in real time, see a collected average of what that focus group was reacting positively, neutrally, or negatively to which I freaking love that stuff. And then there would be a Q and a at the end, right? Most, well, yeah, it would be mostly the research group asking the questions, but the questions were all designed to get us to a list of things that we wanted to accomplish and a list of things we didn't want to accomplish. Right. And without question in every single market against every single demo, whether they were hardcore WWF, hardcore WCW, a little bit of both, or didn't watch anymore, the one thing they all agreed to is they loved the unpredictable nature of professional wrestling. That's why they were fans. So that's one of those little boxes that I put on my list of things to do when we launch Nitro to keep it unpredictable. Make it feel as spontaneous as possible. In my creative meetings, in a lot of my production meetings, I talk to the people on the creative team about please try to keep in mind, not all the time. You don't want to constantly be unpredictable. Then it's just a schmoz. 
But if you can do things and lead people to believe one thing is going to happen and then go in a different direction, you can overdo it. Granted, but being unpredictable is... Why do you think I had Lex Luger come out unannounced, unadvertised? Awesome. Unpredictable. Surprise. There you go. That's exactly why I was excited to hire Lex Luger. Because now I had the opportunity to check one of those big boxes that, that I learned from that research crew. And the same thing applies, you know, to, to pay-per-views. You know, you get people into a pattern. That's cool. That's cool. It works. Very beneficial in many respects. But yeah, every once in a while, you got to just shuffle that deck a little bit to keep them on their toes. Good point. Very good point. Now, as we head towards the, the finish, we head towards the wind down here. We were talking about Hulk Hogan before, and I'm probably the biggest Hogan fan maybe ever up there. Uh, so I don't want to you know, come off as negative before with the creative control and stuff. I mean, he's the biggest star ever in the business, so it's understandable why he had creative control, this and that. But just in your mind, though, tell us maybe not a different side of Hulk, but just why he would he has like creative control and why he is the game changer he was because he revolutionized the business in the 80s with the hogan era the golden era he re-revolutionized the business with the nwo and wcw in the mid 90s so just to put a positive spin on the hulkster because i love the hulkster but <laughs> no in this look in let's go to the first part of your question why did he have creative control let's go back in time it's 1994. Hulk is negotiating and talking to this cat named Eric Bischoff, who he's never met. <laughs> yeah, right. Knows nothing about. Yep. I was the C Squad announcer turned president of the company all of a sudden. But and now and on the other side of that table is Hulk Hogan, who's been in the business now for uh 14, 16, 17 years, has become 1994 at, at, at not too long ago had become the, the face of professional wrestling period never before has a professional wrestler made the cover of sports illustrated you know and and reached that level of mainstream kind of crossover appeal but now that same cat Paul Hogan sitting across from this kid he's never heard from, never heard of before has demonstrated no abilities in this industry other than being a half ass decent announcer and an adequate play-by-play -play guy. Um, and now he's running a wrestling company. And by the way, he's running a wrestling company that has a history of being a cluster fuck creatively because that's what WCW was yep. creatively. It had no one in WCW, no one in WCW before me, um, had established themselves as anything remotely close to a big time storyteller creator. Nobody. And that's, I, I, I love Dusty Rhodes. In many ways, he was a mentor to me. Um, ton of respect, but Dusty wasn't able to break through. Dusty wasn't able to turn WCW around to be anything more than a real minor league distant number two to WWF. So if you're Hulk Hogan and you're coming in with all this success and you're sitting across from someone you don't know who represents a company that's never done it, don't you kind of want to protect your character and your trademark, which by the way, Hulk Hogan owned? Or are you just going to walk in and say, here, write me a check and I'm going to give everything to you. And if you want to bury my character and bury my trademark, and make me completely useless in the future, have at it. You're not going to do that, especially if you're smart. And especially if you're smart and you've got an even smarter attorney. You're going to protect that asset. How do you protect it? You have the ability to decide what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. No one's going to come to Hulk Hogan in 1994 once we sign him and say, <laughs> joke's on you, dude. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to come out as Mr. Nanny. <laughs> We're going to shoot an angle with you in a tutu. He had to protect himself against that. You laugh because that's kind of funny, but they brought Jorge Gonzalez out in a fucking monster suit. They made Kevin Nash come out in a dunce cap, like yeah. the Wizard of Oz. There were like hunchback midgets and stuff. So it's not like what I'm saying. Yes, it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of true. That's why Hulk Hogan had creative control. And that's why I don't blame him for wanting it and why I didn't push back against it. 
I don't blame them. Didn't blame them then and certainly don't blame them now. Um, and that was the only time, as I said in the documentary, that it created an issue for me. It's not like he used it all the time. He didn't. Um, no. I, I think the fact that he had creative control, in this case, it was devastating because that was Hulk's call. And it was my call to either fight it, which would have been unsuccessful, especially given I only had a couple hours to, to get through it. I could either have fought it. I could have tried to compromise, which I did. Um, or I could have supported, which ultimately what I had to do. I don't think it's that hard. It is for people that are wrestling fans that just don't care. Or don't, I shouldn't say don't care, but just don't understand the complexity of the wrestling business, especially at that level, when you're dealing with talent like that. I could have done what Vince McMahon did, McMahon did with Steve Austin and just argued and argued and argued the day of the show until Steve Austin got in his car and went home. Said, screw it, I'm not doing it. Then where would I have been? You know? I think about True. those things. True. Plus, you got to be honest. Hulk is the god of wrestling. You kind of, you know, he has the, the proven track record of success too. So that kind of goes hand in hand too. Like he knows his character. He knows Hulk Hogan, what he would, wouldn't do, and, and where he should be in in wrestling. To a degree, you know, Hulk. Hulk. Let's just say the NWO storyline was very good for Hulk. The, the timing of that, the fact that Scott and Kevin came over, the fact that I had that idea. Um, the fact that Hulk got to sit in a movie trailer and watch it play out for a couple of weeks and finally be able to go, Ooh, that's too good. I got to be a part of that and tag himself in. Uh, that was, yeah. that was a very good move for Hulk because prior to the NWO, that red and yellow Hulk Hogan was fading into the sunset as far as being a viable character, because the audience had moved on from that. They, they'd gotten it. They'd loved it. It changed things. It changed the wrestling business. It changed Hulk Hogan, Terry Bollea's life as Hulk Hogan, the character. It changed a lot of things. But by 1994, the audience had more or less moved on. Not all of them. Not all of them. Um, and the fact that something new came along, it's like an actor who's been playing in a certain type of movie for so long that, you know, okay, we get it. And then all of a sudden comes along and plays an entirely different character in a really cool movie. Boom. That actor or actress has an entirely new career in front of them. And that's kind of what happened with Hulk. The NW storyline was something that was just, it was almost custom made for his resurrection as a character. Now, before we let you go, where can everybody find you social media otherwise and, uh, and the pods Twitter. I'm at E Bischoff. On Instagram, I'm the real Eric Bischoff. That's about it for social media. And um, certainly 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff and Conrad Thompson, anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. I also do a show. I've started doing this about two months ago called Strictly Business. It's a separate podcast. Now it's under the 83 weeks banner. So if you go to 83 weeks, and you subscribe and request notifications wherever you get your podcast or on YouTube, by the way, um, you'll be notified as soon as Strictly Business drops. We drop it on Thursdays. I'll be doing it in about an hour and a half or two hours. And we cover the business of the wrestling business on a week to week basis. We don't really get into creative. We don't get into finishes. And what about this? Or why couldn't we have done that? We don't get any of those conversations. We, we focus specifically on the business of the wrestling business. And we're getting a ton of traction from that. So I encourage people to check that out. Uh, my new book, Grateful, is available uh, over at Amazon. It's doing pretty well. Pretty proud of that book. And uh, what else? That's it for now. Tune in next <laughs> For <week>. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Eric, thank you. yet to come. Yes. But thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. All right, Joe. Hey, and I'm sorry it's taking us so long to get together. I know you've been trying to get me to do this for a long time, and I love doing it. I love doing it with you. It's just, it's just been a little crazy, but yeah, um, <laughs> your schedule's nuts. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to do it, and I look forward to doing it again. All right, Eric. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the time. All right, say hi to Kevin for me. I miss him. Will do. All right. Bye bye.